All right, recording's out. Welcome back to Thursday Study Hall. We are doing critical reasoning today, <laughs> defining specific goals. We'll see what that means in the context of the problems that we've got here. But basically, the big issue that people have in critical reasoning is that they kind of don't really know what they're talking about. And they start looking at the choices. Yeah, they, they go to the choices with this sort of half-formed idea of what they want. You know, the answer choice. It doesn't really serve them too well. Um, here's the copyright notice again. These problems are from the free GMAT prep software, copyright GMAC. So that's where they're from. Okay. Let's do a problem. Remember, this is where when you have a multiple choice problem, this is where you pick your answer from. So now in the chat box, please. So let's do that. Let me let's let me put a problem on the board for you. And then we will Good. Okay. Here's your problem. Remember where multiple choice answers are found. Those are found. Underneath your name. Right there. Go for it. Okay, let's pick an answer choice. Of some kind. Let's just do the answer choice. Okay, we've got remember the way this test works, by the way. Um if you if you don't there's no such thing as not answering a question i mean you have to you, you have to answer all the questions and you have to do it in the order that they give you the questions i mean you get one shot if you if you have a staring contest with the question question will win that one then you will lose it just what will happen i mean you, you can't not answer the questions so you might as well just school yourself in that mentality, right, from the get-go. Okay, so here, here's, I don't normally post up the group responses, but we, we have two very favorite, favorite answers here at this point. I mean, we have mostly, we have people liking A and we have people liking D. And we have a smattering of responses for the other choices, but it, it's pretty much too, it's like pretty bimodal here, so. But okay, so so here's the thing, right? What what do you think makes these things hard? It's kind of a generic question, but because most most of these critical reasoning problems, when you think about it, are things that it's at some point are things that people people that normal people of perfectly average brain capacity would have like normal conversations about. So I mean what do you think it is that that makes this hard? It is a lot of words. That's part of it. Part of it is that there are a lot of words, although although there are not, you know, an unmanageable number of words. But here, you know, think about that right there. Reversing polarity. Um, I don't. 
I don't know that I know what you mean by that. Thank you. What I think you mean there is that sometimes people accidentally pick answers that do the opposite of what they want. If that's what you mean, then that's a thing that happens. If you mean something else, then I don't know. Um, Mm, ah, wait a minute. So Colleen says, Colleen says this. Let me, let me actually put this on a new page because this is an interesting idea. The logic is more narrow than we are accustomed to. But, but is it? But is it really? I mean, this is something that you want that you really want to think about because if you think about it, what we're accustomed to is very, very narrow. It's actually it is actually incredibly narrow. I mean. Like if you think about everyday normal conversations that people have, the the kind of focus that people have on issues of discussion is actually really incredibly specifically focused. I mean, it depends on what what the particular conversation at any point is. Like for example, let's say that you have let's say that someone is going to go on a diet. Okay, and here are two questions that someone might ask. Where the first question is this one, and then the second question is this one. So, like, think about the difference between these questions, right? They, they look similar in words if you see them on a page. But they're like, whoa, so totally different. And the reason is focus, right? Like one of them is specifically about cause and effect. And one of them isn't. And one of them admits all sorts of other incidental things. And one of them doesn't, right? Like if, let's say the person's also like adopting some sort of crazy, you know, Workout program at the same time, then that's totally relevant to question two, but totally irrelevant to question one. And the thing is that in a totally normal conversation, we would completely realize both of those things, right? If, if the conversation was, does that diet make people lose weight? Then people would dismiss things about working out. They'd be like, that isn't, that's just not what we're talking about right now. Dude. Like people would, would realize that. So, whereas if it was about someone who's going to do it and may or may not succeed, then that would also, you know, oh, they're also doing this. Okay. So, I I, I would actually challenge this part of, the, of what you're saying there because I think that I think that what we're accustomed to is actually way more focused than what you think it is. At least in any sort of conversation that has a point. I mean, there are some kinds of conversations where it is not really, like the kind of conversation that's not meant to be productive is a different kind of conversation. Like, you know, where you're just sort of staring at the sky and, you know, saying random stuff. And that's different. But any sort of conversation that is meant to be productive is very, very, very focused. And in fact, it probably has much more narrow focus than what you're accustomed to using here. Because this is the whole point, right? You, you know exactly what the conversation is about, and you have this exquisite sense of what is relevant and what isn't relevant. Whereas, like, see, that, that's the point with words like this. I mean, words like this are a problem because in normal conversation, we don't, we don't say words like this. That's the point. Like we literally do not ever say things like that. I mean, we don't we don't say things like weakened argument or undermine assumption or logically complete. Like we just don't we don't do that. 
when we talk in terms of specific. Aha. And I mean, even if we say it doesn't make sense, even if we do that, we still, I mean, we don't do that unless, unless it is clear to everyone what it is and what making sense is. And if it isn't, then people will usually kind of, you know, voice their, their doubts of that, right? Like if, if, if the question is something like, hey, your plan won't work. If someone doesn't know what the plan is, then they'll they'll be like, uh, what plan? I don't know, I've lost, right? So and this is the single most important thing, right? Like this is this is what you have to do, right? The key to problems like this is is to translate all like abstract logic words. Into, into specific. Like the guideline you can use here is you can just use the everyday conversation guideline. Like basically, and if you if you're using words that you would not use in normal talking with normal people, then then bad. And I mean this 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 is I mean no offense to the person who wrote this, but this is this right here is the wrongest thing that I've seen someone write in months, if not years. I mean, the logic of this section is absolutely, totally real world logic, and that is the whole point of this of the critical reasoning section. I mean, it, it, it's it, it is that's exactly what it is. It's a test of within the confines of being able to test things in a standardized test. It's real world logic. And if you use formal logic, it will not work and cannot work. So, um, I mean, because that's actually the point of these problems. The point of these problems is that you do have to use real world connections that, that go beyond formal logic and stuff. Like, if your reasoning is limited to if A then B, if B then C, therefore if A then C, then not going to work. So, and you'll see this enough as we go. So, but yeah. But I mean, totally fundamentally depends on real world connections. I mean, they're not, they're not obscure connections. I mean, they're connections that the crowd makes. And this is one of the reasons why they crowdsource the problem. And this, is, this is one of the biggest reasons why they make them experimental before they make them real problems, is they want to give them to several thousand people and make sure that you don't make the connections they expect them to. But the no, demand logic totally is everyday, unremarkable, normal people logic. In fact, that's totally the whole point of it is that. And it's important to realize that. Okay, so this here. So let's talk about this. The deal is we need to, we need to translate what this means into specifics. So let's do that. But I mean, again, it, it, important to know this. I mean, not to keep coming back and banging on the same idea, but there are a lot of people out there who think this, and people who think this tend to get worse and worse and worse at it the more they study it. Because, you know, this idea that you have to replace your normal intuition with some, like, learned kind of thinking is is not true. It's totally off base. And if you think that way, then you will just keep getting worse at this. I mean, at the very most, what you might have to do is take your, your ordinary intuition and supplement it with a couple of points about certain types of problems and certain limitations and stuff. But if you think you have to get rid of your normal intuition and replacing it with some artificial way of thinking, then you will definitely get worse at this. I mean, that's a guarantee. I mean, you will definitely score lower than you did before ever studying. Because you can't do that. Not a thing that would work. But like this. Okay, let, let's talk about specifics here. So, the goal of reading this passage is to know what, what they want. So okay, we we want we can plant this we can plant corn at half the usual spacing. There's not as much yield per plant. 
But still, profits can double. So, okay. Let's see what happens. Let's see what the deal is. So we can grow. We can grow twice as many plants per unit area. Because of the, you know, we can grow them half the base. Just hard. But each plant will give less corn. So we can get twice the profit per unit area. Okay, so what is it that we need in terms of specifics? Like what what do we want to know? What are we looking for? We're looking for a reason why what? All right, so Austin is going somewhere with this. That's kind of the next step here. The first step is to just define what it is that we want, right? We, we want a reason for this. So what do we need, right? A specific goal. So. The specific goal is we, we need a reason why profits will be twice as high, even though yields are not twice as high. So, there you go. This is what we need. So there's a couple of things about this, right? Like notice that, I mean, you're just taking what you have in the passage and, and putting it into a statement. But just, just stating this in terms of specifics will probably make you realize a lot of things about an answer choice that you, that you need. I mean, the first thing is that it's going to have something to do with profit. And so this is where um, Austin and Stephen Chen, that's where they are getting with this. Because, I mean, focus is also a thing, right? If they start talking about profits, you're, you shouldn't still only be thinking in terms of numbers of plants and things like that, right? Like, this is just because that's not the only thing that they're talking about, is basically, yeah. I mean, if, if they're talking about profits, I mean, this is going to sound very common sense in these terms, but, you know, if they're talking about profits, then you need to think about profits. Yeah, sure. If they're talking about profits, you need to think about profits. How about that? Okay. Right? Profit is revenue minus cost. I mean, this happens to be the only fact about business that you have to know on this entire exam, by the way, is that profit is revenue minus cost. So, like, literally, this is the only thing that you have to think about, about business on the entire exam, is that profit is revenue minus cost. So what we need is that. We need something that will increase revenue or decrease costs to compensate for the loss of yield. We need something that will increase revenue, 
temperature or decrease costs to compensate or to make up for the cooler yields. That's what we need there. This is the thing. So this is like a standard. Notice we haven't we haven't even touched the answer choices yet. We haven't looked at them. And this is this is what you should do in pretty much all of these problems. You know, as much as much as you can, at least, is you should you should do this. You should make a standard for a correct answer before looking at the choices. Like these shouldn't be processes of elimination at first. I mean, that's a very bad way of going about this. I mean, if you have to do that as a backup technique, then you can. But at first, you should look for something, and there will be one choice that does that, and other choices that don't. Like, okay, so here, something that will be more revenue or less cost to make up for that. So let's take a look in that light. There's a standard. Let's take a look at the choices and see if they do that. All right, so A says, when you put the rows closer together like that, you will spend less on these things that cost stuff. That's good. That's what we want. If you look at this, I mean, B is, I mean, you might have taller plants, but we still know that they're lower yields. I mean, like, if you see B, some people pick B, but the thing is, lower yields are lower yields. I mean, if you, the only reason you might like choice B is if you kind of imagine that taller plants might give you more yield, but the problem is that the words say they don't. I mean, you, that's, that's not what the word said. And you still have lower yields. So, per plan. So, height is irrelevant. As far as C and E, I mean, C means you've got more cost. So, this is bad. And this goes the wrong way. This is... This is this this is the opposite of what you want. You would like to see lower cost. What about what about D? Number of plants will almost double. So does this explain how you could end up with double profit? I mean, if anything, like when when I first read the passage, I, I kind of just, you know, the default assumption here is that your rows have approximately the same number of plants, right? So you, you would you would think that if you can plant 15 inches apart, then you would have exactly twice the number of plants. So this is almost even making that less strong. Because if they're, if they're saying this, then this actually means that you're that you wind up with fewer plants in a row. So it certainly doesn't add anything. So that one problem with this choice is that it, it doesn't it doesn't make anything stronger. I mean if anything it, it makes like it either affects nothing or even makes the original weaker. 
because I, when you read the original, the, the default assumption should be that you will have exactly twice as many plans, unless, unless you thought otherwise. So that, that's one problem there. But the other problem is that the profits are exactly twice as big. So if you think about this choice, you have fewer than twice as many plants. Now, now we know that. Times lower yield per plant than you used to have. So this would absolutely not explain why you have double the profit. Because you, I mean, in fact, both of those components are below where they have to be, right? You, they, 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 they told you, you have less than twice as many plants times less than normal yield per plant. It's going to mean way, way less. It's going to be substantially less than two times profit. So, therefore, still unexplained. I mean, we still have no idea why it's twice as much profit. So, nope, doesn't explain it. And I mean, the reason why, I mean, if you, that, those are the reasons why choice D is wrong. But honestly, you don't even have to go through that much brain work with choice D. I mean, you, you should actually be just, you should you should be very suspicious of choice D from the very beginning because of that. Because of that right there. I mean, choice D doesn't even go into the whole notion of profit. I mean, remember one of these whole like one of the main points of this entire thing is they want to make sure that you can focus on goals. And they want to make sure that you understand the focus of a discussion and that you can stay focused on it. This, this is a thing about profit. So if you pick choice D, you're not even touching the idea of profit, even though that's supposed to be the, the, the whole point. So, well, you mean theoretically, yeah, James, but I mean, that, that stuff's already under discussion, right? Like one thing that you'll discover about these problems, if you think about it even a little bit, is that the, the answer choices introduce new things that are still relevant to the topic, right? So, but they want to make sure that you know what, what goes into profit and what doesn't. I mean, if they were just talking about overall yield, then the wording of the question would talk about overall yield. I mean, this is the other thing. They are not tricky people here. There are never any underhanded tricks in the questions. Like if this if this was only about plants and yields and stuff like that, then the answers would only talk about plants and yields and stuff. And this statement would only talk about plants and yields. So if you're talking about plants and yields and then suddenly they hit you with profit, then you should know, you should absolutely 100% know that you are going to have to bring in something new that has to do with profit. Because they do not trick people. There are zero trick questions on this ever. It does not happen. So if you have something that looks like a change of subject, it's a change of subject. And you should look for an answer choice accordingly. So, yeah. And there's also, that's a, Rose has a good point there, too, about logical transition words. So, right, because if, if these factors that we're mentioning were actually making that happen, then you would not use the word never at last. So, there you go. Okay. Um, all right. So here's the deal. When da, 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 da. All right. Yeah, so A is the answer that we want. Now, the, the other thing that you've got to know about these problems is you, you, you should know how they use adjectives and stuff. Um, like, here's this answer choice that we just saw. You, you, you've got to know how they do this, 
like let, let, let's talk about this adjective right here. Let's just talk about that for a second. Because okay, um, this this kind of thing is a lot of people kind of gloss over that or ignore it. You really can't. I mean, remember this is not the quant section. They're not going to be making you calculate things. But like when you see qualifiers like this on quantitative stuff, like on, on words that represent numbers or numerical things in general, I mean, the first thing to know about that is that they're important. The second thing about that is they affect the situation in exactly the same way they would if people use them in a normal conversation. Like, for example, imagine that you were talking about this with someone who actually is a corn farmer. And you were talking about this exact topic of profit per acre. And the farmer was like, well, dude, we control our living and irrigation costs a lot. I, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't make the farmer get into, like, numbers with you. I mean, you would just know what that meant. You would know that it meant that that cost was some super significant fraction of the profit per acre. You would just know that. You would know that that's what it meant. And you would know that if you could eliminate that cost or you could mitigate it somehow, then it would absolutely increase profits. Because otherwise, the person would not say it that way. You would, you would know all of that. I mean, it, it just would be a hit. You know, here's another, this, this is another problem that, um, I'm just going to pull up an answer choice from a different problem that we did in, in one of the other study halls. I'm not going to pull that actual problem up. I'm just going to pull up the answer choice. Because these, these adjectives are so strong that even looking at an answer choice with them without even having the context of the problem should already give you a pretty de decent sense. Like this one, like take a look at this answer choice without even having a context of the problem. You don't even need it. Just consider that and that. And just imagine any normal conversation that would contain this. So, I mean, you'd be talking to someone who's thinking about buying an electric car, because that's why you'd be talking about the price of an electric car, right? So imagine conversation so with a potential buyer of an electric car. Sure. And they're like, well, this car is already expensive. And X thing makes it a lot more expensive. I mean, we, we know what this means, right? Like, what does that mean? about that person and their purchasing decision. What does it mean? Just that little snippet of conversation. You had like a hundred consumers like that thinking about buying this kind of car. What would that mean they would do? If you want to use big words, you can use you can call them price sensitive consumers. But yeah, I mean, right? It means they wouldn't buy it. it means they would not buy the car. <laughs> That's what it means, right? Price sensitive consumer is like a you know business PowerPoint double talk way to say it. But they're not going to buy it. It's what, it's what you want to take from that. And the reason why they do it, the, the, the reason why they do this with adjectives like this is they don't want these things to devolve into quant problems. I mean, they're not, again, they're not trying to be tricky. I mean, really, really get that in your head. They're not trying to be tricky. 
they're, they're trying to be as untricky as possible. I mean, they only use qualifiers like this in exactly the same way that people use exactly the same kinds of qualifiers in conversation. I promise you. I promise you they do. Um, but, you know, and, and just think about it, right? If you just imagine hearing, a lot of people underappreciate the importance of this kind of thing. Like, if people tack on descriptions like this in a conversation, that's, like, super significant. I mean, that tells you a lot about the entire context of everything. You know, it tells you about, it tells about everything, right? Like, in, in this kind of context, it tells you about the affordability of the car versus what the, what the consumer has, and it tells you about the attractiveness of it and, and whether it's considered essential, and it tells you about all of that. Like, here, costly tells you a lot about how much this is relative to profit, stuff like that, sure. So, like, when you, so, yeah, when you see this kind of wording, absolutely, you should put a lot of weight on it. Because they're not, they're not going to give you math numbers that prove that, because that's not the point of the problem. The point of the problem is just this could be a factor that would make up for that. But, yes, you should, you should think about that. All right. Um, let's let's do another problem. Good. Okay. So, uh, I mean, yeah. In any of these problems, they are going to add new ideas. That's the whole point. I mean, they. Because again, you know, think about here. Um, think about how this stuff works on on planet Earth, right? Like if you. Like if you, uh, let's say you're on a jury or you're considering buying a product um, or you're trying to decide whether your friend is lying about something or anything, right? I mean... And any other kind of I'm on the fence type of thing. Like if anyone says, I mean, like what would make you think X more strongly? Like what would make a better case for Y? I mean, these are always going to be new outside concepts. I mean, always. Right, and they have to be. They can't just reintroduce evidence that we've already seen. I mean, because you know, the evidence you've already seen is the evidence you've already seen. Right, so these these, these can't these can't be things that that are already within the boundaries of, of what you've already seen. So yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, what is a PMP exam? I don't know what a PMP exam is. Jack, remember, there's never any tricks ever. There are no tricks. There are no tricks at all. The word, the words mean what the words say, and they don't mean what they don't say, and they they really never lead you down the garden path unless the garden path is where you are supposed to go. I mean, like, honestly, if you are looking for tricks, then that's the problem right there, right? That, that you're getting tricked by yourself. I mean, you just, it's, it's like, it's like the difference between these two conversations right here. I mean, there's no tricks in this. You just have to think very carefully about what the, you know, umbrella of the discussion is. Like, if this is the discussion, then this is strictly in terms of cause and effect caused by the diet. But if this is a discussion, then it's like every single thing the person does during that period of time. So, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, if, you, if you have a standard, if you have a standard like this and you see something that is a very obvious fit for it, then about the pull the trigger question, you may as well just pick it and move on. I mean, really, that part, partly that's a personal qualities question. I mean, if you tend to get led astray easily, then once you see this, you should just move on. Absolutely, you should. I mean, because otherwise, the answer choices might sing songs and you listen to them. Um, 
if you tend to be more stubborn about it, then you can read through the other choices just for the reassurance. But if you do tend to listen to the songs and the choices they're singing, then you might be better off not reading the rest of the choices. So, okay. Um, That that whole idea of out of scope is not a terribly useful idea because if you could, I mean, honestly, if you could answer what is out of scope and what isn't, that would mean that you could already solve the problem. So there's not really much much fruitfulness to be had there. I mean, that's just sticking labels on things that you already understand. You know, like not much benefit really to have there. But okay, let's do another problem. Let's do one. How about not this one? The difficulty level is it doesn't matter. No possible benefit of thinking about that at all. Like literally, that's something you should never ever think about ever. Okay, remember where the multiple choice answers are found. Uh, I should probably pick an answer to this pretty soon. Okay, so a couple of stragglers we don't have an answer choice here, but um, all right, let's take a look. This one, the group did better on, so we can probably get through this somewhat more quickly. But let's just let's talk about it, right? So, see, these problems with blanks, I like these problems because they they uh, they they make people think in the right terms more directly. Like they make people actually think in terms of how do I fill in the blank rather than trying to you know classify the question too much. Right? They they're, they make people think about what kind of specific do I need to fill in that blank. So okay. Anyways, what do we have here? Well, you've got two companies that are ostensibly in the same situation, but you have a policy that saves one of them money but would not save the other one money. So this the the, the policy is to screen, is to do this kind of street screening, to do certain tests. Why does it help? Like, why is it good? Well, it discovers stuff that, it like up front, it discovers stuff, what it says in there, finds conditions that lead to very expensive treatment if left untreated. So, you can discover stuff with expensive long term consequences. Okay. Aha, that's what it does. 
Set the save, got it, money. But it wouldn't save. Rent card money. Uh, why not? So the standard that we would need here is why you wouldn't this. Like the standard is mean the reason why that policy wouldn't say rent card money, even though it says garment money. That policy, meaning that one. So if you uh, want that on the table, it's, you can pretty much predict exactly what the answer is going to be. And I mean, in a lot of cases, you can. In some cases, you can't. I mean, if it's a profit-related problem, you might just you might just be something like, well, it, it's going to be something random that increases revenue. But in problems like this, you can almost exactly predict what the what the what the answer is going to be. Like long-term consequences, right? So here, you it's reasonable to think that you could predict pretty much exactly what it's going to be. Right? That, that this is you can predict that it's going to be some form of long-term is important to Garnet, but not. Right. And that's going to be elephant. So, yep. People stay at it longer. Now, you should still know when you review the problem, you should still be able to eliminate the other choices. I mean, the, the, because the other choices should be wrong. Like, you're, you're not going to have choices that are good, but not as good as the correct answer. I mean, you should. You should definitely have four choices that are distinctively wrong answers and one choice that is the right answer. It should not be like, you shouldn't have a situation where you've got eh, neck and neck, but this one is better. Like, in other words, you should never have a situation where one of the choices becomes the right answer if you get rid of the right answer. Like, some people in the forum ask that. They're like, if I got rid of the correct answer, which one would be the right answer? I mean, that's the point, right? The point is that not, nothing should be. All of the other wrong answers should be wrong answers. And it's important to identify that. So, okay. This one, uh, people mostly pick E, not everybody. Yeah, no, it's very rare for you. To be unanimous, there were a couple of non-responders, and maybe seven or eight people who didn't pick it. But okay, so this one, this one just means that the treatment is not perfect, but we don't. That doesn't really affect anything because th th that's basically what it is, right? It does not entirely eliminate is. All they're telling you here is, okay, the treatment isn't perfect, which is fine, but we're talking about aggregate effects anyway, so that those are not affected. So that, that's problem number one. The aggregate statistics aren't affected. Also, there's no reason to think of, I mean, this is not a difference between Garnet and Renko. I mean, this is the other thing, right? Like, you, you, this is going to seem really obvious when I point it out, but the correct answer has to be a difference between Garnet and Renko. I mean, duh, right? But we, we need to explain why Renko doesn't benefit from something the same way that Garnet does. So, I mean, one thing that should be an immediate realization, even if you don't understand all of the specifics right away, I mean, I'm talking immediate realization, like less than two seconds, is the correct answer must be some kind of difference between the two companies. I mean, of course it does. You know, I mean, this is true with, with anything that needs to explain why two entities differ at all, right? Like, 
why did Lindsay really like that concert, even though Stephanie didn't? Well, it has to be different if Lindsay and Stephanie. Right, of course it does. It has to be something. So, right. I mean, th this should be, before you start taking apart language and stuff like that, you should just look at common sense stuff like this. It's got to be a difference. So, because this alone, I mean, honestly, just that. That's enough to get rid of. Let's see how much we can get rid of with that. Well, we can get rid of A. We can also get rid of B. I mean, C is a difference. Um, D, we can get rid of D, too, because D is not a difference. I mean, D is saying they're the same. So something as, something as obvious as this is already enough to get us down to two choices which are C and E. So this is a lot easier and more profitable than starting to pick apart the language of the choices. I mean, if we need to explain why Garnet does X and Renko doesn't do X, it's got to be a difference between Garnet and Renko, yeah. I mean, of course it does. So I'll always look for that kind of stuff first before you start. You know, to, before you get your scalpel out and start doing surgery on words. I mean, look for the big things first. So this one, as far as choice C goes, significantly more employees. So this, as far as having incentives to do this, that that's, if they either save money or they don't, and that's not a matter of, number of employees. Like the whether you save money on this is going to be per employee and not it, it's not going to matter. Right? There, there, there's no reason for us to think that the number of employees matters because people either get the conditions or they don't. So if, if there are savings there will be savings regardless of the number of employees. I mean, they would, if there were some sort of difference based on the number of employees, they would have they would have to spell that out in the in the passage. Like sometimes you have group health insurance, which is less expensive if you have X number of people, but you can't just make that up. I mean, they they would have had to t to tell you that. You know, if it was like these prevention programs are way cheaper for larger companies. Okay, well, sure, then that might matter because that would change the balance sheet. But you can't just, you know, make that up. So, careful with that. I mean, careful with the whole extreme language thing. Because, like, a lot, a lot of things that some people would call extreme language are, you know, like, think about this, right? Like, a lot of people think that these are extreme language, but, but this is the kind of extreme language that actually helps answer choices do what they do, you know, I mean, it, it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with language that looks extreme in questions like this, you know, if, it all depends on what the task is. I mean, if you get one of those questions where, where you're trying to prove one of the statements, if it's like, which one of these is established by the given information, then extreme is not great. But if it's a question like this, where the whole goal of it is to bring in outside information that helps to establish something, then, then extreme is totally fine. In fact, it might even help. So just be careful with that. Um, right. And, okay, there are a lot of things happening in the chat here. Let's, let's see. Um, when we can have more people, there could be more. I mean, James, all of that stuff would scale with the number of, of people. Like, if you had n number of people, you would have x amount of cost. And if you had 10 n number of people, then you would have 10 x cost. I mean, if, you know what I mean? Like, for n number of people, you would have X cost with the program and Y cost without the program. And if you had 10 and number of people, you'd have 
10 X positive to program and 10 Y. I mean, if X is less than Y, then 10 X is still less than 10 Y is the point. So, and th the only way that would change again is if you had some sort of giant bulk price break for the group health program, which they would have to, they would have to tell you that if that was a thing. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. All right. That's, I think that covers the comments. All right. Yeah. Yeah. If you, uh, oh, there's no, I mean, if you skip the word many years, then, then yeah, but that's the point. You, you don't, you don't skip the word many years. That, that, that's the thing. The thing that matters a lot. And you would want to read that part carefully because that's the whole, that part is the whole reason why the policy works. So you wouldn't want to just, you know, read that with half attention. Like I'm talking about this comment from the chat box here. Like, I mean, this. That, that comment right there. I mean, yeah, if you skip the many years part, yes, you'll get it wrong, but that that part is clearly something that's important, at least, you know, to go back and read that, because that, that, that's the, that sentence is the only sentence that explains the importance of this program. So that sentence explains why program saves money. So you need to read it carefully. All right. I mean, because you that's what it comes down to, right? You have to understand why this policy would not save money for some other company. So you know that you have to understand the exact particulars of why it does save money for the one company. So that means that means going back and checking that out with total attention. So you're right about that, but it, it's not, you don't need to pay that much attention to every random sentence, right? You, you can tell that it matters that you pay attention to that. All right, let's, let's take a look at one more. It, she's got a qualifier on it, but you're sticking a qualifier on something that doesn't matter. I mean, the number of employees is, because all of those things will scale with the number of employees, so. Even if you stick a qualifier on that, it still doesn't matter. You know, I mean, it, I, I see what you're trying to do here. You're you're trying to test the waters with some sort of guessing method of, oh, if I see a qualifier, I will pick that answer choice. Don't do that. I mean, there there's simple guessing methods will never really win on this test. They're very good at defending against that. But I mean, it's in your conversations, right? If someone says something irrelevant, then sticking qualifiers on it still makes it irrelevant. So, but it's good that you're thinking about that, but the qualifiers only have the effect they do if you're talking about something that that is actually relevant. No, it wasn't a, it wasn't a guessing method before. It, it was something that people people don't, Sometimes people don't realize the importance that those have when they are in the choices. Like I think people just sort of think that they're like la 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 vague words, and they don't they don't realize how much functionality they have when when they're there. Um, oh, choice D here. Choice D is is a non difference. Choice D is saying that Renko employees are in the same situation as Garnet employees. So of course that can't explain anything, right? I mean, that, this, this this is saying that they are not different. So that that's definitely not going to get you anywhere. I mean, th this means this is saying they are not different in this way. I mean, definitely can't explain the difference. All right. So let's let's do one more of these. Yeah. 
Let me go, let me do this one. And then we can do the other ones in the stack next time. All right, you know where the, you know where the answer choices are. All right, let's pick a thing here pretty soon. Let's pick a thing. Still have some non responders. Maybe about 30, 20, 30 more seconds to pick something. All right, um, Lauren, probably more time than you really need, but yeah, it's point here is the is the is the skill skills development, not not the time thing. So time time management is really just acknowledging when you're stuck and moving on and picking something when you're stuck. If you knew that, you're not going to ever need to worry about minutes and seconds. So should be kind of a non issue. Okay, let's let's um talk about it. Alrighty. If you're still a non responder here, you should you should pick a thing. Let's discuss. Alright. Notice again, you don't you don't have to read these things from top to bottom either. I mean I I don't read them from top to bottom. I mean what what I do is I, I read the thing first, like the bottom conclusion part, just so that I know what the discussion is even about. And then I read the rest of it. Just because, you know, when you're reading a bunch of random facts, it's you're you kind of like, why why am I reading all these facts? You know? Like think about being on a jury and being presented with evidence. I mean, it, it's important to know what the case is. Like imagine being shown a bunch of documents and photos and evidence and stuff. And then, oh, after all that is done, they're like, well, oh, by the way, this is a fraud case. I mean, think about what that, that whole thing would be like. I mean, the whole time you'd be like, why are you showing me this? What am I supposed to do with that? Like, what am I looking for? Right? I mean, it's, I don't know. I, I mean, at least maybe just me, but I, Reading these random facts, kind of, I kind of feel disoriented. Really, I mean, you may want to at least think about reading the the conclusion part first, just so that you have a blessed clue what it is that you're supposed to be thinking about as you read the rest of it, right? Like this is. So we've got no. I I don't. I, I have a terrible memory. That's the point, right? Like if you. I mean, I actually do have a, have a very bad memory. I mean, it's in the first percentile. It's the, the lowest percentile. I've actually had, you know, brain trauma from my childhood that caused that. But no, my, 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 it's not, it's not modesty. I mean, like I had, a, I had a head trauma when I was seven that destroyed a lot of my memory parts of my brain and, and the 24 hour day parts too. But well, that's a separate conversation. So, this is I mean, no, I mean, my, my memory is so bad that, that I have to look at my own ID for my birthday on the worst days. It's, it's that's actually not a lie. So which also should tell you something about how much memory you need to do well in the GMAT. I.e. not much. So I mean, in fact, I mean, long term wise, that is you know, because people, in fact, people with really, really good memories have a much bigger task cut out for them on a test like this. Because if you, 
you know, it's 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 not it's not I have a bad memory, but I got an eight hundred. It's it's actually almost more like I have a bad memory, so I got a perfect eight hundred. I mean, it, it's the bad memory is much more of an asset here than a liability. I mean, if you think about it, because you can't like. The number of people who have a, an amazing memory and who are good at pattern recognition in the whole world is zero. Like, no one is good at both of those things. And, I mean, honestly, the people who really have a difficult task to cut out for them on this exam are the people who, are, who have amazing memories because those people are not good at pattern recognition and stuff because they've never had the need. And it, it, the problem is worse if they come from a, educational system that emphasizes memory and and or a profession you know that that relies on it so I mean those those kinds of people are really up against a difficult situation here but again side discussion kind of getting away from the point here but because I mean if you if you do have a better memory you might be able to retain all of this that you've read and then when you get to this conclusion you might be ah okay then you can see what the relevance was but I mean there's no way right I mean I, there's no way that I could retain this stuff long enough to get down here so but what you should at least think about doing is you should you should think about reading this part first and then you know because th this is the part that I mean yeah this is the part that gives relevance to everything I mean like same thing a lot of these problems are about profits and such and if you have a conclusion about a profit then you immediately know that you should only read the rest of everything else in terms of dollars cents cost revenue you know things like that. So if you see like these, this company has been fined repeatedly for dumping stuff into the environment. Well, you care about the fines, not the pollution, because profit, right? And I mean, you can selectively ignore stuff and not other stuff, and it makes it more efficient too. Like if you read this from top to bottom, then frankly, you have no idea what you are supposed to ignore and what you are supposed to not ignore, and so. It's probably going to be a lot less efficient that way. I mean, you know, there's there's no one size fits all here, and you should really try on a bunch of different kinds of reading and a bunch of different orders, and you should just kind of throw stuff at the wall until something sticks. But you should not feel like you have to read everything in the order that it's given because that's not very yeah, just play with it. But consider reading this sort of thing first. So we want to know, so we got, we know that we have some sort of thing that is talking about export oil. So like already there are some factors in mind, right? Like we, do you think about it, there should be some brainstorming that happens here without, without even reading the other stuff, right? I mean, you can just, you can just read this alone and already kind of get at some of those. So we want to know, like, we, we want to not premature to conclude. So we want a reason why that that will not happen. So there's this idea that more oil fields will give more oil exports, and we want this idea to not work. For a reason why that won't happen. So without even reading the given facts, I mean, you can kind of already know where this is going. I mean, it's more oil fields are going to give you more oil. So if that means not no more export, then it's kind of just a reason not to export the oil. Like, I mean, we, we, we know that, right, just without even having read the rest of the passage yet, I mean, we, we know that new fields will give new oil. So, we need something, we need a reason why 
you we want to export more. So that, that could mean you know more demand inside the country, or maybe you know, maybe existing oil fields are running out of oil or something. Et cetera. All right. But th this is before we even read the rest of it. Okay, now we have. So for a long time we haven't made new fields, but now okay. And then this all right. The economy is getting better, so we are making new oil fields. Okay, sure. So basically this. We need a reason why we will not export more. About that. Yeah, all right. So I mean, A is not a thing, right? A, A is not a change. A is saying that nothing will change. So that doesn't explain anything either, either way, because A doesn't change the situation at all. B uh -huh. well what do you know about cars? Yeah, cars use oil. See, this this is the kind of thing I mean by real world connections that you need to make. I mean, this is not, you know, this is not a super obscure genius connection, but, you know, cars, cars use oil. Um, I am seeing this problem for the first time, actually. Um, I just kind of pulled it out of an archive that I have. But honestly, any problem I haven't seen and the last three or four weeks is totally like I'm seeing it for the first time. In fact, it's more like two weeks. So, again, memory. Yeah, I mean, if I haven't seen it in the last two weeks, it's pretty much like I've never seen it at all. Okay. Yeah, so demand within the country, sure. There you go. This choice looks good. The, uh, the, yeah, I mean, what else? What else is your country going to do with oil, though? I mean, you know, you, you define it. But that's not an that's not an absurd thing to. That's not an absurd connection to make. Okay. Investment. Investment is not what we're dealing with here because we want to know whether we will export oil or not. So money, where the money comes from doesn't matter. And in fact, if the investment is, I mean, if people are investing so that they can get oil, then this goes the, this goes the wrong way, if anything, because they're saying from foreign sources. So this, either this is irrelevant or it goes the wrong way because, you know, this would be more export, if anything. So either, either, either nothing or means more exports if the investment is going to be compensated with oil. If new technology is available to recover oil, then this is not this is this would be nice. Although this doesn't have anything to do with the new fields. Also, so first of all, it has nothing to do with the new fields. But also, the thing about this choice is, I mean, this is going to push up supply even more. So that if anything that's going to push towards more export. Because this is a surplus of oil. 
So, I mean, this is not, not, not only does this not give us a reason to think that we will not export this oil, but this just throws more oil into the equation. So, this just makes it even more likely that we will export oil. This would be, this would be a wrong way. And then this one, the productivity, not so much of an issue, because as long as they have any productivity at all, then, then we're still there. I mean, like the actual productivity, the actual amount of productivity isn't the issue, as long as it's not zero. So, there you go. I mean, if... So the thing is, I mean, wh when you think about connections like this one, first of all, you got to think about the reasonableness of the connections. And the thing that, the, the, the other thing that these problems feature is the wrong answers are so wrong that you'll be fine, you know. I mean, the, the wrong answers are, are so completely wrong that these kinds of things should be non-issues. You know, like, for example, here in, in this problem, we have something that is a non-change. We have a wrong way answer. We have a wrong way answer. And we have a non-factor. So if you have like non-factor, wrong way, wrong way, non-factor, and then, oh, I don't know if we can, you know, I don't know if we're finding, it can be factored in there. I mean, you know, like, that's kind of like saying we have black, 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 and very light gray where you want white. You know, it, it's still very clear which one is the right answer, even if you even if you thought this was an issue of some kind. It's 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 you can tell because the wrong answers are so wrong, right? Um, the oh no, anyway, we're we're like eight minutes over time. I just realized so I don't have time to do anything after the study hall except say goodbye and run. But um, all right. As far as what if the new cars are not dependent on fossil fuels, I mean, we got to be realistic here. There's nowhere in the world where people drive a majority of cars that are not oil based. So you, you can't make up science fiction here. Just, it's not a thing. I mean, this is, this is planet Earth. Important to realize that. I mean, yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's just kill it. Thanks, everybody. Did not realize it was overtime by so much. Good afternoon, good evening, good night. Thanks, good everyone. We got a couple more of these problems for next time, so the next study hall is probably going to be more of these problems. But all right, thanks very much, and until next time.